Jerusalem Online, I'm Mike Greenspan. Like a clap of thunder on a clear day. That's the language Israel's official commission of inquiry used to describe the events at Hebron's Cave of the Patriarchs last February when Jewish settler Dr. Baruch Goldstein opened fire on Muslim worshippers, killing 29 and wounding scores more. The commission found Goldstein solely responsible for the massacre, but also uncovered some serious shortcomings in Israeli security procedures at the scene. Meanwhile, new revelations about an Israeli MIA. Missing Israeli Air Force navigator Ron Arad was held and questioned by the Syrians in 1989 and not passed on to the Iranians as previously thought. That's the thrust, says German television, of previously classified papers from the East German Stasi Security Service. The new information raised some serious doubts about the veracity of contacts with the Syrians and gave new hope to Arad's family and friends that the Israeli MIA, shot down over Lebanon in 1986, may still be alive. Also this week, a history-making meeting in Jericho. The Palestinian Governing Authority for Jericho and the Gaza Strip held its first ever meeting in a building previously used by the Israeli military government. Thirteen ministers took part in the historic gathering presided over by Nabil Shat. No word yet on when PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat will arrive in Jericho, but there are plenty of words flying here in Jerusalem, where Mayor Ehud Olmert is promising to block a possible Arafat visit. We'll talk about Jerusalem, Jews, and Arabs with Mayor Olmert on this week's Look at the People and the Stories Behind the News. What's more, we'll show you how Israel and the Jewish world are teaming up to tackle the challenges of the year 2000. We'll hear about the emergence of the forgotten Jews of Poland half a century after the Nazi Holocaust. And we'll take a trip to Jaffa, where an old house is bringing new life to one of Israel's most colorful neighborhoods. This and more on Jerusalem Online. But first, there's a new man in town since late November last year, at any rate. Ehud Omer, Jerusalem's first new mayor in more than a quarter of a century. He replaced the almost legendary Teddy Kollek. Omer took office at a critical juncture for Israel's capital city, always a hotbed of social, political, and religious life and strife, and now due to become the hot potato of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Welcome, Mayor Omer. You have been making headlines recently with your public campaign to block a planned visit to Jerusalem by Yasser Arafat. The Prime Minister, Mr. Rabin, says that everyone is free to come and pray in Jerusalem's holy sites, including the mosques on the Temple Mount, what Arafat says he wants to do, and you want to stop him. Why? Well, I have no argument with the Prime Minister about the right. Everyone has a right, no doubt about it. But one can't ignore the very special circumstances when a person uh, declares, as Arafat did just a few weeks ago, that his intention is to wage a jihad, a bloody war, a wally war, against uh, uh, Jerusalem, against the Israeli uh, people because of Jerusalem and he wants actually to separate East from West and create a Palestinian uh, capital in East of Jerusalem. One must be terribly concerned that his visit will be used not for praying but for instigating the emotions of the Arab people in order to uh, bring about the kind of result that he wants. How do you plan to stop him? Well, that's what I uh, was trying to, um, uh, to do. I was trying to convince the Israeli government that uh, it's not a matter of principle, it's a matter of uh, political wisdom, that we should uh, not allow him to come now to Jerusalem. It's too volatile, it's too risky, it's too sensitive. We have to wait, maybe a few years from now, but not right now. Will you still try to stop him? Absolutely. How? Well, I believe that we, if we will rally the uh, public opinion in Israel and overseas, if indeed hundreds of thousands of Jews will come to Jerusalem and say to the Israeli government, hey, not this time, not this person, we have to protect Jerusalem. Jerusalem is too sensitive, too important, and too holy for everyone to take the risk of creating this turmoil. I believe that the Israeli government will be convinced. Many Israelis seem less excited and less upset about the possibility of an Arafat visit than perhaps you do. On the other hand, there has been some excitement and some people have been upset recently about reports of bu massive building plans that you have for the city, which include putting up many apartments and homes for Jews on what has until now been the predominantly Arab eastern side of the city. First of all, I disagree with you. I think that the, uh, based on the uh, number of uh, reactions that I got from across the world, from very concerned people, right or left, uh, Jews and non-Jews, that they fear of the possible outcome of a visit by Arafat in Jerusalem, 
I think that uh, many people are very upset about it, and I suggest that uh, no one, including the Israeli government, will underestimate their, their sensitivity. What about, about the building, building in the, every part of Jerusalem, I don't accept and I don't agree with this uh, division of the Arab side of Jerusalem and the Jewish side of Jerusalem. It plays exactly into the hands of those who want to separate the city. There is one Jerusalem, a united city. It is the capital of the state of Israel, and everyone has a right to live in every part of the city. And that's what I say. The municipality doesn't build. We are not building any place. We are not investing the municipality money in the expansion of, of new Jewish neighborhoods. But I definitely in favor of everyone living everywhere and I will not be the first mayor that will say hey Jews are not allowed to live in a particular part in Jerusalem it's an, it's incredible I mean it's outrageous even to think this way Israel Jerusalem as you said is a united city it has been united since Israel reconquered the eastern part of Jerusalem from the Jordanian Liberated, army I dread to say whichever in 1967 the United City, Israel's capital, a very volatile city shared by Jews and Arabs. What do you do to stay atop this volatile mix to make sure it doesn't explode? Well, we are doing a lot more than was done in the past, by the way. My uh, message to the Arabs living in uh, Jerusalem is very fair, very honest, and very simple. I say no political status for the Palestinians. It's a one united city, and it is the exclusive capital of the state of Israel. Full equality and sharing for everyone that lives in the city, Jews and non-Jews alike, in education, in the quality of life, in housing projects, everywhere. In fact, just last week we have appointed a new uh, deputy director general of the education department of the city who is a Palestinian from the uh, east side of Jerusalem who will be in charge of the uh, Arabs uh, education system. This is is something entirely new and it brings the message that we really are prepared to share with them. But we are the sovereigns in East of Jerusalem as well as in the West of Jerusalem. Briefly, Mr. Mayor, because we're almost out of time, Jerusalem is looking forward toward its uh, 3000th anniversary. Prime Minister Robin has promised that come what may in the peace talks, Jerusalem will not be divided. It will remain Israel's capital. Are you confident that Israel will reach its 3000th uh, birthday celebration in one piece? I'm definitely confident that Jerusalem will remain the united eternal capital of the state of Israel and only of the state of Israel. But in order to make it absolutely guaranteed, we have to do a lot more than just make statements. And my advice to the Prime Minister is that the government will do a lot more instead of giving commitments to the PLO to protect the institute that are operating in the east side of Jerusalem and are trying to divide the city. We have to invest in the city, to build the city, and to protect the integrity of the city. Mr. Mayor Ehud Olmert, thanks very much for joining us. And when Jerusalem Online continues, we're going to bring you news about a revolutionary new link-up between Israel and the Jewish world. Stay with us. Back in the late 1970s, Israel finally got around to tackling some long-neglected problems in neighborhoods built for new immigrants who had flooded the country in the early 1950s. They came mostly from the Arab countries of North Africa and the Middle East. An innovative plan called Project Renewal teamed up Israeli neighborhoods with Jewish communities abroad. It was an overwhelming success. Now, in the mid-1990s, another period of mass immigration, Israel faces a host of new challenges. Once again, a creative problem-solving partnership is emerging, a partnership called Partnership 2000. Jerusalem Online's Carl Pakal brings us the details in this special report. The peace process that began in Madrid, moved on to Oslo, and even to Arab countries that have no diplomatic ties with Israel, has now moved closer to home. Many Israelis living along Israel's confrontation lines are already banking on a peace dividend. Moti Banyas of Metula on the Lebanese border is one of them. We prepared a thousand dunam right close to the border. At the time the border will be open, we can attract people from other places in the world that be interested in doing uh, international business here and in the Middle East in general, uh, to do it right here in Israel. Just a few kilometers away at Tel Chai College, Aliza Amir Zohar thinks that peace could bring some big changes to the institution she heads. Tel Chai, which is in the end of all the places of the world, it, it will uh, um, find itself in the middle of the world. While the peace dividend remains a vision of the future, 
For Israel's underpopulated and underutilized peripheral areas in the Galilee, the Negev, and in the Jerusalem Gateway, there is a new vision that's happening right now. It's called Partnership 2000, and its creators expect this Jewish agency-sponsored project to help Israel prepare for the challenges of the next century, economic growth and immigrant absorption. And the two are interdependent. Jobs are the key factor in the successful absorption of the 600,000 immigrants who have arrived in Israel in the last four years, and the expected hundreds of thousands in the years to come. The goals of the project are, uh, are two. One is to develop the periphery of the country, mainly the Negev, the Galil, uh, Jerusalem, which is the, the capital city and the uh, Jerusalem gateway, the Adulam area. And the second is to really use this program in order to build a bridge for relationship, for partnership between the Asper Jewry and the people of Israel. Partnership 2000 will nurture growth on a region-wide basis. The old distinctions that pit town against city and both against the kibbutzim and moshavim will be replaced by a comprehensive approach. It is an open-ended model that divides the target areas in the Galilee, the Negev, and Jerusalem into 27 regions. Partnership 2000 was inspired by the success of Project Renewal that made empowerment at the neighborhood level work and created a new depth of involvement for diaspora communities. That willingness to get involved will be called upon again as diaspora communities link up with regions in Israel. In Kiryat Shmona, in the Upper Galilee, city planners are already networking with their neighboring towns and kibbutzim on projects that range from tourism development along the Jordan River to an artist workshop and gallery center. We are trying to create a bottom-up process. We believe that only processes like this uh, bring change. And in order to achieve that, we made a decision which is unique for public organization to decentralize the decision-making process on our own budget and enable the local residents, local leadership, the government, communities from abroad to participate with us in doing planning and allocation. Partnership 2000 will be a dynamic process. As with Project Renewal, diaspora communities will be part of the process and part of the progress. The story of Partnership 2000. Coming up next, discovering the lost Jews of Poland, right after this. Jerusalem Online Headlines, I'm Carolyn Benetton. Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin praised his administration's economic performance in the past two years, but said it still hadn't tackled the housing problem sufficiently. Speaking at an economic forum, Rabin pointed to lower unemployment and a surge in exports as achievements. He also called for increasing trade with the United States. A law student at Haifa University has petitioned the High Court to ban smoking on the university's grounds. Just one more sign that non-smokers in Israel are beginning to stand up and not take it anymore. Smoking is still socially acceptable here. 32% of Israelis light up. But the health ministry is now launching a massive educational campaign aimed at students, soldiers, and the ultra-Orthodox community who smoke more than anyone else. The ever-popular Jerusalem Film Festival kicks off this month. Over 130 features, documentaries, and animated shorts will be screened. The festival will honor this year legendary director Elia Kassan with a retrospective of his work. Also generating a lot of excitement, 11 new Israeli feature films, more than double last year's number. Students like the ones who plagiarized Isaac Asimov's stories in a school science fiction competi competition this week may find it a little harder to cheat, at least on their school exams. English teacher Lauren Lewis, appalled at the amount of cheating going on at university level, has now created an anti-cheat software program. Teachers type in multiple choice questions and the software scrambles the entries in 39 different combinations, making it virtually impossible to peek and cheat. The largest private fund set up to invest in Israel is looking into purchasing Israel Discount Bank or Bank of Poalim. The Renaissance Fund has a capital of $157 million and an investment potential of more than four times that size. Founders are from the United States and Canada. Investments in the region could include a joint tourism project involving the Red Sea coastal towns of Aqaba and Elat. I'm Carolyn Benetton for Jerusalem Online. Before World War II, roughly three and a half million Jews lived in Poland. By the end of the war and the Nazi Holocaust, only 300,000 or so, that's about 10 percent, were left. The vast majority of the survivors quit Poland in the decade following the war, and of those who remained, many chose to put their Judaism behind them. 
Why did they do it? And why are some of them now, as it were, coming out of the closet? Some of the answers to those questions from a Jewish detective of sorts, Rabbi Michael Shudrick, working for the Ronald S. Lauder Foundation in Poland. He joins me now. Welcome. Thank you. We're talking about secret Jews in Poland. Is that the subject? Absolutely. We're speaking of Jews who did not, Jews born during and after the war, who were brought up as Poles without knowledge of their Jewish identity. Their parents had decided it was better for them to cut all ties with the Jewish people. And only within the last 10, many, only within the last five years, have discovered a variety, way, a variety of ways that in fact they have a Jewish parent. And how do they react when they discover this for the most part? It's difficult to say because I only meet the ones who then are interested. It's a self-selecting group that I meet. But from what we can gather, it's a shock. I mean, you discover you're not who you are. And that's a shock in any situation, and particularly in a society that perceives itself as, uh, as homogeneous, as, as, as Polish society does. Now, you're working with these people on, on what level? As a pastor, as a counselor, as an historian? Certainly not a historian. Uh, as, their, as their rabbi, as their friend, uh, sometimes as their uh, counseling trying to help them have the opportunity to return to the Jewish people, to give them the information and the knowledge, the background, that if they want to become Jews again, and really for them it's the first time that they should have the chance to do so. How many people are we talking about, more or less? How many do you know of so far? It's very difficult to estimate. I, I, the one concrete figure I can give you is that within the last year, we've had over a thousand people who have attended our, our different activities in Poland, where we now are active in seven cities. Uh, and all of these people are people who have Jewish ancestry. Startling. I understand that in addition to helping people who have discovered that they're Jewish, you've also on your own discovered some Jewish artifacts that sell part of the history of the war years. Correct. Uh, actually, what, what was happening is that in the building where the foundation is located, where we have now a youth club, Maccabi Sports Center, uh, educational center, offices of different new Jewish groups just first coming in the last two, three years. Because we were running out of space very quickly, we were now renovating the attic. Uh, and, and as workers were pulling up floorboards, they discovered amidst rocks and sand, they started pulling out documents. And they brought them downstairs to me and they said, gee, are these anything important? I said, very much so. And what they were, we pulled out over 180 documents and artifacts from two families that lived in the building where we are situated now, which is next door to the only standing synagogue in Warsaw. Two families that lived in the building during the ghetto period. Their what personal happened to documents. these families? One of them was a single man by the name of Moshe Dov Burstein, and we know that he was killed in Treblinka in July of 1942. A Nazi death camp. The other family, the Melchior family, the father was Eli. We do not know what happened, but I received a phone call about two months ago from the sister of Eli Melchior, from uh, Sarah Urbach, living here in Israel, and uh, she said she's been looking for some information about her brother for the last 53 years. She herself fled in 1939. This is just by coincidence that you heard from her? Uh, an article appeared here in the Mariv newspaper. She read it. She contacted Mariv. They've, she found me through Mariv. Uh, she called me in Warsaw, and I promised her that uh, I would bring her copies of the photographs. We've, we found 20 photographs. We assume some of them must be her family. It's like a Jewish family reunion half a century too late. Right. Tell me this, Rabbi. What's the point of what you're doing in in Poland, in Warsaw at this stage. Are you trying to revivify a Jewish community? And if so, why? What's the benefit, conceivably, for someone saying, okay, I'm Jewish in Catholic Poland today? Okay. Our goal is to give a chance for these individuals who are of Jewish ancestry with a Jewish parent, who have been neglected, in a sense, by their parents, by their community, cut off from their heritage to give them a chance to reclaim what is rightfully theirs. Some people would say the way to do that is to convince them to come to Israel if they're Jewish. I would not disagree with that. But what is essential, and this we know from experience on the ground working in Eastern Europe, is first they have to be Jewish. Then we can discuss where they're going to live. But until we have them 
involved in, the, in Jewish life. You know, we don't want to bring Poles to Israel, we want to bring Jews to Israel. Rabbi Michael Shudrick, this is another of those fascinating and endless angles on Jewish, often tragic Jewish history. Thanks for coming in and telling us about it. And this reminder, you're invited to keep in touch with the Jerusalem Online POB, the address for your comments, questions, and suggestions. And here is the address. Jerusalem Online, POB 3303 in Jerusalem, Israel. POB 3303 in Jerusalem. We can also be faxed at country code 9722. 381-658. That's 9722-381-658. Do remember to tell us when and on what station you watch Jerusalem Online, which continues right after this. We are back. Before there was ever a Tel Aviv, there was a Jaffa. The Arab port city on the Mediterranean coast was one of the urban centers of the Holy Land throughout the centuries. But in this century, when Jaffa became a neighborhood of Tel Aviv, its grand old homes gradually fell into disrepair. Now things are changing. Jaffa's back in style. And places like the house on Kedem Street are leading the way. You'll take a guided tour in this special report. On a Jaffa hillside sloping down towards the sea, the house on Kedem Street was recently opened to the public. The original house, designed in the Alwan Ottoman style, was built about a hundred years ago and since changed hands many times. For the past twenty years, the house was abandoned, standing vacant and neglected. Two years ago, it was acquired by Mali and Amnon Saban. We bought the house and we wanted to live there. But over time, we realized that our goal, really, was restoration. We kept as many of the original features as we possibly could, the arches, floors, and pillars. Restoration work required the assistance of expert Jewish and Arab craftsmen. The arches and round windows that admit light to inner rooms were rebuilt and restored to their original state. In some cases, the process became rather complicated as new items were manufactured to match the original fittings. We based all the house carpentry on the small partial sample that we had. A gallery was opened at the house, which is also used to host various events. Today, the house is furnished in rustic style, with old-fashioned sofas, wooden cupboards, and bureaus and carpets from Turkey and Morocco. Here you can find original ceramic pieces and other items that harmonize with the original Mediterranean-style architecture of the house on Kedem Street. A blast from the past carrying Israel into its future, which brings us to the end of another look at the people and the stories behind the news from Israel. More next week right here on Jerusalem Online. I'm Mike Greenspan. Shalom.